President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. This is my first video update coming to you from Limassol, Cyprus on a very windy Tuesday morning. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with the BBC documentary Putin vs. the West. And uh, I talked about this documentary yesterday in my Clown World segment, how Boris Johnson, when he was uh, prime minister a couple of weeks before Russia launched their special military operation, Boris Johnson claims that he had a phone call with Vladimir Putin. And in that phone call, Vladimir Putin threatened Boris Johnson and threatened the UK with missile strikes. This is what Boris Johnson told the BBC for this documentary, and I quote, he said, Boris, I don't want to hurt you, but with a missile, it would only take a minute or something like that, jolly. That is what the former prime minister told the BBC with regards to this telephone conversation that he had with Vladimir Putin. Well, the Kremlin they have responded to Boris Johnson's claims and they are saying that Boris Johnson, he may have lied about the uh, conversation with the Russian president. Dmitry Peskov said, quote, there were no missile threats. When he explained challenges, he, the Russian president, explained challenges to the security of the Russian Federation President Putin remarked that if Ukraine joins NATO, the potential deployment of NATO or American missiles at our borders would mean that any missile could reach Moscow in mere minutes. Peskov wondered if Johnson had lied deliberately or simply didn't understand what President Putin was talking about. If the latter is true, people should be concerned for Johnson. Peskov added. So, Another segment of this uh, BBC documentary, this three-part BBC documentary, Putin vs. the West, that is now making the rounds on social media, are the comments from one-time Ukraine president, the chocolate king, Petro Poroshenko. Now, Poroshenko, he is the, he was the first post Maidan elected president, post-Maidan coup elected president of Ukraine. He was the guy that was, uh, that was put in place as president of Ukraine after the US-EU coup in Ukraine and after the, uh, the government, the Newland government headed by Yatsenyuk ran its course. Yats is our guy. Poroshenko came in, ran for a president. He's this rich oligarch uh, chocolate manufacturer. And uh, he came in and became president of Ukraine. He is the guy, he is the president that gave the green light to start a war in the east of Ukraine, in the Donbass. He actually approved the, uh, the war against his very own people in the east of Ukraine. This is the guy that launched that war. And he was also the president that lost that war. And he's also the president that was negotiating with Hollande, Merkel, and Putin, the uh, Minsk Accords, as well as the officials from, uh, from Donetsk and Lugansk. So he was the president, he was the guy in charge during Minsk I and Minsk II agreements. And he said this with regards to those agreements. And I quote, this document gave Ukraine eight years to build an army, economy, and a global pro-Ukrainian anti-Putin coalition. The Minsk agreements signed in 2015 made it possible to reform the armed forces of Ukraine and form an international coalition against Russia. As Putin said in an interview a couple of months back, Ukraine was built as a battering ram against the Russian Federation. And that is what Poroshenko is admitting in this BBC documentary. Poroshenko, Newland, Poroshenko, uh, Hollande, Merkel, 
they're all very, very proud of the fact that in their mind, they pulled a fast one on Russia and on Putin. They fooled the, uh, the Russian president and the Russian people into actually believing that, the, that they would enforce the Minsk agreements that the UN Security Council ratified as well, that they would enforce those agreements. Instead, the plan was never about peace in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the plan was about building up the Ukraine military so that sometime in the future, it would be used to destabilize Russia. And they're very proud of the fact that, uh, that they fooled Putin. They're so proud of it that they have to, uh, they have to say it now publicly over and over again. Merkel has said it twice in two interviews that we have on record. This is actually the second or third time that Poroshenko is now coming out and saying, yeah, we were never going to enforce the Minsk agreements. It was all about using those eight years to build up the Ukraine military so that we could, so that we can create a coalition against Russia. Those are his, his words, an international coalition against Russia. That is a direct quote from Poroshenko from this BBC documentary. But you know, as, uh, as these, uh, these one-time leaders are so proud of the fact that in their mind, they outsmarted the Russian president, what they failed to consider is that perhaps, perhaps Putin also understood that uh, these, these snakes would never enforce the Minsk agreement. And he used the eight years to not only build up Russia's military, hence all of the, uh, the missiles and weapons that Russia has and that are not, not running out, even though for the last 10 months we have been told by the collective West that any minute now Russia is going to run out of uh, missiles. Perhaps, perhaps Russia used those eight years to build up their uh, missile and uh, weapon stockpiles. But more importantly, Russia used those eight years to build up their economy because they understood that when the time would come and Russia would have to have to face Ukraine in some sort of conflict because they knew what NATO was up to in Ukraine. They weren't blind to the fact that NATO was building up the Ukraine uh, uh, military. Russia understood that sooner or later, there's going to come a time when we have to uh, face off against Ukraine and possibly the collective West. And so we better build up our economy because one of the tools that the collective West is going to use to, uh, to hurt Russia is sanctions. And uh, sure enough, the collective West, their plan was shock and awe sanctions in order to destabilize the Russian Federation and lead to some sort of a regime change in Moscow. And Russia used the eight years where the, the collective West France, Germany, Ukraine refused to enforce the Minsk agreements. They used those eight years to build up the Russian economy and to withstand any and all sanctions that the collective West were to throw at Russia. And sure enough, Russia did withstand all the sanctions that the collective West threw at Russia. More sanctions thrown against a country than any other sanctions thrown against any other country in all of history. And Russia not only withstood those sanctions, but according to the IMF, an institution that is not pro-Russia by any means, <laughs> this is an institution that is very, very anti-Russia, very pro-West, even they came out the other day with a study claiming that in 2023, according to the IMF, Russia, miraculously, the IMF is, they can't believe it, but they are saying that Russia miraculously will return to growth in 2023. The IMF claims that Russia will register in 2023 a growth of 0.3%. It's a small growth. It's a very small growth, but it's a growth nonetheless. It's economic growth nonetheless. And it's quite remarkable that Russia is going to return to growth in one year, given all of the sanctions that were uh, 
levied against the, uh, the country. And even the IMF cannot believe it. Meanwhile, Germany is in recession. Sweden is in recession. I believe that all of the EU is either in recession or heading towards recession. And 2023 is not going to be a good economic year for the European Union. Unlike Russia, which will be returning to growth in 2023, the EU is going to, uh, things are going to get a lot, lot worse in 2023 for the European Union. EU foreign ministry spokesman, Peter Stano, he said this with regards to EU member states supplying tanks to Ukraine. He said, and I quote, the EU believes that the supply of Western tanks to Ukraine is not an escalation of the conflict, but only a response to the escalation by Russia. You see their twisted logic? It's not an escalation. Tanks are not an escalation. It's just a response. It's not an escalation, a response. If you go by that logic from the European Union, you can make the argument that Russia's special military operation in Ukraine was just a response to the war started by Poroshenko in 2015 and the constant shelling of Donbass over the eight years up until February 24th of 2022, right? It wasn't an invasion. It was a response to everything that you were doing over, over uh, eight years if you go by EU logic, the EU, NATO, they love to say they are not a party to the war. We're not a party to the war. Even when Baerbock said we are fighting a war against Russia, all of the EU uh, leaders and the NATO officials, they came out very, very quickly. And they said, no, 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 no. We're, we're not a party to this war. Forget what Baerbock said. She, uh, she misspoke. Uh, her words were twisted by Russian media. Um, she was lying to, to impress a date. <laughs> I was lying to impress a date. <laughs> Someone said that in the comment section down below a couple of days ago. Very, very clever uh, comment. I was lying to impress a date. That's what Annalena Baerbach meant to say. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, they love to say we are not a party to this war. We are not fighting a war against Russia. We're not fighting a war against Russia because they know if they were to say, if they were to admit that they are fighting a war against Russia, a proxy war, a hot war, a war that could lead to, uh, to a nuclear war, to boots on the ground, they know that if they were to admit that, then all of the support that they have from their citizens, whatever support that they have for their citizens, to continue to, uh, to support Ukraine financially or with weapons, it would just go away. Because people in Europe would freak out. People in the U.S. would freak out if Biden said we are fighting a war against Russia. People in the U.S. would say we don't want none of that. No American boots on the ground in Ukraine. And all of these leaders, they know this. That is why they always have to say we are not fighting a war against Russia. We are not a party to this war against Russia. Yeah, we're going to send tanks to Ukraine. 14 Leopard tanks, 18, 88 Leopard tanks. In a year's time, we'll send Abrams tanks, maybe, possibly. But we're not a party to this war. The Netherlands is now considering sending F-16s. Mark Rutte said that if Ukraine asks us for, for F-16s, for fighter jets, we'll consider it. Macron said the same thing yesterday. He said that his government is studying the possibility of uh, sending fighter jets to Ukraine. Olaf Scholz yesterday said that fighter jets are off the table. But Ukraine isn't asking Germany for uh, fighter jets. What Ukraine is asking for Germany is from Germany are uh, submarines. <laughs> that is what they want from, uh, from Germany. Meanwhile, Stoltenberg, the NATO chief, the secretary general of NATO, he said that they, Russia, are actively acquiring new weapons, more ammunition, but also acquiring more weapons from Iran and North Korea. Anthony Blinken, he said the same thing. He said that Russia 
supplies Iran with modern weapons, in turn receives drones from Tehran. That is a statement from the Secretary of State. So you see how this works? The collective West, they can provide drones and high Mars and tanks and possibly F-16s and possibly long range missiles. And this is not an escalation, it's just a response and they're not a party to the war. But if Russia, if Russia gets ammo from North Korea or drones from Iran, well then North Korea and Iran are a party to the war and this is an escalation according to the collective West. You see how, how all of that works? Meanwhile, the Ukraine government is saying that they need about 200 fighter jets in order to, uh, to launch some sort of uh, counter counterattack against Russia and take back territory, including uh, Crimea. So now the ask is not just some fighter jets, it's 200 fighter jets that uh, they are looking for, 200 F-16s. Lloyd Austin was, uh, actually, I think he still is, in South Korea. And he penned uh, an article in a South Korean uh, publication where the U.S. Defense Secretary says that the U.S. military is going to be in South Korea and they are going to perform various military drills, including nuclear, including nuclear uh, drills. And all this time we thought that we should be afraid of Russia using nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, the Pentagon chief, the defense minister, the defense secretaries in South Korea, talking about using nuclear weapons uh, on the peninsula in order to, uh, to combat North Korea. You see how all of this works? <laughs> Whatever they accuse Russia of doing is exactly what they're doing or what they plan to do. That is exactly how, uh, how all of this is, uh, is working. Brazilian President uh, Lula, he refused Macron to, uh, to send military aid to Ukraine. So Macron, after Schultz, Macron, it looks like Macron approached Lula wanting uh, military aid to send to Ukraine. And Brazil said, no, no, we are not going to do it. We're not going to send military aid to Ukraine. You know it's getting pretty bad, pretty desperate, if you have Schultz and then Macron going to Brazil, one after another, begging Brazil for weapons so that they can then send them to, uh, to Ukraine. You know things are going very, very bad for the collective West when you see that happen. In Argentina, they also refused uh, providing weapons to Ukraine. All of Schultz traveled to Argentina and the Argentinian president, he said, no, we are not going to send weapons to Ukraine. We don't want to be a party to any of this craziness, any of this madness. We want peace. We don't want escalation. But then the EU and NATO, they say, yeah, but, you know, we're not a party to this war and we're not escalating. It's just a response. It's not escalation. It is just a response. Meanwhile, there is, uh, there is some talk that the European Union is about to roll out another sanctions package against Belarus. They've agreed on uh, a sanctions package this week. And in February, in about two more weeks, the EU should be ready to roll out a 10th sanctions package against Russia. 10, 10 sanctions packages against Russia. And not one sanctions package has worked as Russia is going to, uh, to register growth, economic growth in 2023. But nope, let's do a 10th sanctions package. Why? Because the 10th one is going to surely work. But this sanctions package is, uh, is going to impose sanctions on Russia's nuclear industry and on diamonds and Belgium. They are saying that they are not going to approve any sanction that, uh, that has to do with diamonds because they have a lot of uh, 
a lot of business with diamonds, so they're not going to approve, to approve that. And Hungary has said that they are not going to approve any sanctions that has to deal with the Russian nuclear industry because they rely on Russian nuclear, on the Russian nuclear industry, and they have various projects that they are working on with Russia in the nuclear energy space. So what these sanctions are going to include, I have no clue. I have no idea what they are going to, uh, to sanction Russia with, but we'll see. A 10th sanctions package is on its way. Why not? Why not go for number 10? And after number 10, you can try for number 11. Maybe one day, one of these sanctions packages will end up doing something. I don't know what that something is, but it'll end up doing something. Anyway, I think I will wrap up this, uh, this video. I'm trying to see if I have anything else to, uh, to report. How about Biden's new ambassador, Lynn Tracy, arriving at the Russian Foreign Ministry for the first time? She was greeted with chants of, war is a US business and America is a terrorist country. I don't know if you've seen the video of, of that incident, but, um, it looks like the West finally got the protests that they wanted in uh, Moscow, huh? <laughs> they finally got those protests. The only problem is that those protests are directed at the U.S. ambassador and not at the Russian government. Interesting how, uh, how that works. We have the, uh, the Iranian government. They want explanations from the Ukraine government with regards to a tweet that uh, a statement and a tweet that Ukraine spokesman uh, Podoliak made with, these, uh, with this drone strike at a Russian facility. And uh, Podoliak said, explosive night in Iran, drone and missile production or refineries. Ukraine did warn you. And so Iran is, uh, they're asking for some explanations from the Ukraine government because it is, uh, it is believed that the US, along with Israel, they they launched this drone strike at a facility in uh, Iran in order to, to take out what they believe to be the, the production facility of these drones that are being sent to Russia. And what Ukraine told Iran, according to a foreign ministry spokesman, this is what Oleg Nikolenko wrote on his Facebook page, this is what Ukraine's response to Iran is with regards to this, to the tweet from Podoliak and the assumption that this drone strike was, was launched in order to take out a, a drone manufacturing facility, which is helping Russia. This is what this spokesman said to Iran, quote, Ukraine has repeatedly warned Iran the consequences of supporting aggression against Ukraine will be much larger than the benefits of cooperation with Russia. We do not know the cause of blasts at Iranian facilities, but as a Persian proverb says, do not do evil to others and you won't injure yourself, Nikolenko said in this Facebook post. It's an interesting response to, uh, to Iran. If only the Ukraine government of... Uh, Yatsenyuk and Poroshenko and Alensky, if only they, they had listened to this Persian proverb, perhaps they wouldn't be in this mess that they find themselves in. Do not do evil to others and you won't injure yourself. Did Mr. Nikolenko, this foreign ministry spokesman, did he actually think this post through just a little bit before he posted it on Facebook? Maybe this uh, Persian proverb applies to, uh, to Ukraine as well. Just a thought. Let's do a quick clown world. And uh, this clown world will be very, very quick. It has to do with a statement coming out of Finland with regards to, to their, NATO, their NATO membership. 
Finland wants to join the bloc along with Sweden, its foreign minister said after Turkey proposed a separate accession. Finland is comfortable without NATO's mutual defense protection and can wait until fellow applicant Sweden resolves its differences with Turkey. Finnish Foreign Minister Pekka Havisto has declared, we do not see it as an option. If only one country would be accepted as a NATO member, the minister said during a press conference on Monday, as quoted by the state broadcaster Waya Lee. He explained that the lack of urgency was due to the fact that Finland had received security guarantees from many individual states and considered them sufficient. So there you have it. Now NATO is not so urgent for Finland or for Sweden for that matter. I, I don't understand why is this a package deal? Why is it so important that both Finland and NATO, that both Finland and Sweden get into NATO at the same time? Can someone explain that to me? What kind of like romance is this? Bromance, romance that's going on here. I mean, if Erdogan says yes to Finland, but no to Sweden, why is it so critical that Finland has to enter NATO with Sweden? They won't accept anything else. I don't know. I'm just posing that question. Anyway, that's uh, the clown world, everybody. That's the video, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rockfin as well. And go to the Durant shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care. <laughs>